last video talking about this machine, there's something really important I forgot to tell you. Why is it named Dacuyon? Well, there's three reasons. First of all, this is number 010. So Dacuyon, Deca means 10. And, you know, number 10 makes sense. The other one is 10 horsepower machine. And the last thing is that this thing weighs about 4.5 kilograms or really close to 10 pounds. That machine is like 2.8 kilogram and this is 4.5. It's almost double the weight of the other one. It has a different dynamic on how it drives. Let's talk about what makes that machine run. Like what electronics have I put inside of this that makes it really impressive. We have already talked about uh, motor and speed controller. Basically I use a Castle Creation Mamba XLX. I use a TP Power 3650 3080 kV motor. You already know about these two things. Now let's talk about the battery. All the power that the speed controller and the motor can take, your battery needs to be able to deliver it. Otherwise it's pointless to have such a big motor and speed controller. So what I have inside of this machine um, is so big that the battery is captive inside of it. I cannot take it off unless I disassemble the machine. So when I'm charging it, I just take the top off like that and I have access to my cable for balancing and plug for the battery right here so it's not the best of setups but you know you got to do what you got to do I, I literally did all I can to keep it like that uh, not looking completely out of place with a big battery on top of the seat or something like that so the battery inside of this was initially supposed to be a 5s the power would have been diminished because of a 5s battery but when I received the pack I realized that with some small modification I could make the 6S fit because the company didn't make a 5S for that particular battery. So I told myself I was just going to take a 6S and take one of the packs off of it and I have a 5S, right? So uh, it was maybe a one millimeter short of fitting the 6S inside because you know the dimensions of the battery are not perfectly uh, spot on when you are shopping for a battery sometimes. I made some cutouts for the battery to be able to slide in properly. So that's why you partially can see the battery right here around where your knees would be. And you know, that's fine. It doesn't compromise the strength too much. And you know, it's, it's a lot more power fitting in a smaller package. So that's perfect. So the battery is a HRB 3300 milliamp hour 6S 60C discharge or 120C burst which is plenty because in the real world, this system is never gonna pull more than 300 amps at 25 volts. So the battery is really balanced with the rest of the electronics so for that matter. Now for the steering, I decided I was going to go with something really fancy because in the past I've used some generic 20 kilogram servos and have been working really nicely for me. I've never had one fail, but I really wanna go fancy with this one. And you know, what's the most out of the gate fancy thing you can get on servos uh, usually they're brushless and sometimes have fancy gears like uh, metal or titanium which is exactly what I got so it's out of the box obviously it's in the machine so this is a HSB 3981th th is for titanium um, and it's brushless uh, so it's a lot more efficient and it doesn't do the little buzz that a standard servo does when you force on it so it's a lot more quiet this way and you know once you go brushless it's difficult to go back but it's a really expensive servo so i can understand why most people don't use them but for this again like i said before there's no limit on what's too good for a machine like this so that's why it has a titanium gear servo brushless now with that servo you can program it with the dcp11 from high tech it's basically a servo programmer so you in theory, you use it once to program it when you're done and that's it. Once it's done, it's done. Now, moving on to the radio. Initially, I wanted to have something made from Spectrum because I really like their products, but they didn't have much offering for telemetry stuff. So I decided I was going to go with Futaba because it's a really you know known brand and uh, I've never personally owned one. So I was like, okay, let's try to see what they do. It's a Usually it's a very pricey, high-end uh, brand for controllers and it can talk with telemetry for the rest of the machine and it could have worked for this project but the thing is if i power it on you can use it but trying to read it on the go it's really difficult 
I've also spotted the Futaba 7PX uh, transmitters, but you know they were a lot more pricey and do I really need one of the most expensive transmitter there is? Maybe not. So I decided not to pull the trigger on it. But at Thanksgiving last year, there was a discount on these uh, on these transmitters and you know, I got a really good price on one of them. So I got it chipped here and you know, first thing we know, it, it showed up and I'm really glad that I used that transmitter because you know, it's super easy to read the gauges and transmitter is, you know, fully programmable. It has very fancy stuff. You can program it to say what RPM limit you have. Like it speaks to you basically. It's a really, really fancy transmitters. And you know, I would probably not buy it again because of the price, but just for this, I guess it's fine. The receiver in that machine is the Futaba R334 SBS. And it has telemetry, uh, is telemetry capable. And it only has one part for uh, information sent back to the transmitter. If I have more than one sensor, in this case, I have three, um, I need to have a hub to plug more than one sensor inside. So I have a 100 millimeter uh, serial bus hub from, again, Futaba to make it all work. I talked quickly about the telemetry. And for this machine, telemetry was kind of a necessary thing because um, all of this is really enclosed. So there's not much airflow over it to you know cool it. This machine here is water cooled. I needed to know what the temperature of the motor and speed controller were in real time so I can you know, dial in or maybe change something because it's really difficult when you fabricate something from the ground up and know if you know the gear ratio or if you need you know, to uh, change a little something. It's really nice to know what the temperatures are. Really nice to have it. There's a sensor directly on the motor and there's one in between the cooling channels of the speed controller. So there's these two temperature sensors, which by the way are um, SBS01TE. It also has a RPM sensor because this motor, if I give it full throttle, in theory, if it's not under load, it can over rev. And I want to know if that happens because I don't want the motor to implode because it has too much RPM. So it has a sensor and the transmitter is going to tell me if the RPM is getting too high, which is really fancy <laughs> and I really like it, but you know, it also tells you what the maximum RPM you went today or stuff like that. And you know, if you know the gear ratio, you can know that if you went like to 40,000 RPMs, you know that you went, I don't know, uh, 50 kilometers per hour or something like that. And the last sensor that's kind of a must have when you find out about it is an external battery voltage, uh, SBS01V. And it tells you what the voltage of the battery is in real time. It's really sad when you're driving around and the battery is getting really low and you need to walk to get the machine back in the field and then bring it all the way back. This is a 10 pound machine, so it's quite heavy to bring around, you know, in a field or in a hill or something like that. So you just watch the gauge and you know, okay, I'm getting maybe 20% battery left. It, maybe it's time to get back. That's a heavy machine. So if it can drive itself back, it's pretty good. It's kind of sad that I don't have one for Schottky, but you know, saving weight on that puppy. Sensor weighs nothing, but you know, you get the idea. Most of the basic electronics has been covered already. So what's left is all the fancy stuff. Uh, as if telemetry wasn't fancy. Yes, I know it is, but the original speed controller was so long that I needed to chop some of the capacitor off. You're all connected in parallel. So if you take one off, you can just add it later down the line or really close or whatever. You can play around with them. So. I removed the original capacitors to make it shorter and then that allowed me to have an external capacitor pack which is right here in the front these four big capacitors here uh, each capacitor is uh, 1800 microfarad so overall that's 7200 um, microfarad plus uh, there's a few that are already plugged in the speed controller so it's slightly over what was originally installed in the speed controller, but it's like relocated somewhere else and you know, big gauge wires, so it can output the power it needs, no problem. Something funny about this machine is that I have two BEC, they're like uh, step down voltage uh, units. So there's one for the LEDs in the front and there's one to power up the water pump. The BEC for the pump is a CC BEC 2.0 from Castle Creation. It can output in theory 14 amps in ideal conditions. It's probably a bit less in real life, but still 10 amps for such a small pump is 
for walking in the park, so it's not a problem here. The BEC for the headlights is a CC BEC 10 amps because I don't need that much power. I just need something that drops down the voltage from the battery to something like 6.6 .6 volts. I know it's very specific, but there's a reason for it. Talking about the headlights, the LED diodes are a 50-50 set, uh, 6,000 Kelvin temperature, and there is 60 milliamp hours, and there's four of them. So overall, and they're parallel and series. So you have two channels. So the top ones are connected together and the two bottom ones are connected together as well. Most of the previous machine, they have been connected maximum power all the time. But for this machine, I wanted something a little fancy. So um, I got a Polo Lu RC switch. They're a number 2802. It's a RC switch with MOSFET. And it's incredibly small and lightweight. And basically the way it's wired up, I have a diagram that I can show you, but um, only the bottom two lights are lit up and they're dim, maybe 30% duty cycle. And when I switch up to high beams, the four LEDs are super bright, 100% intensity. So yeah, I have high beam and low beam on this machine. That's why sometimes you see them flash because, you know, I can do it. And it's a lot easier if you have four lights connected all the time and just high power or low power, but having two rows is a different story and you need to have a specific wiring diagram to make it work. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but fancy things. It's a similar story for the LEDs at the back. They're standard three millimeter uh, clear bulb because they are a bit brighter than the colored bulbs. Like the instead of clear epoxy, it's colored, but anyways, standard three millimeter bulbs. I have three of them, and um, when I give it gas and then slam on the brakes, the LED lights up brighter. So kind of like the real machine. Uh, or if I back up, it's gonna brighten up as well. The water pump for this is a self priming pump. It's a micro pump, and it's a uh, gear type. So normally in pumps of that size, you would have a centrifugal pump. But the problem with that is that it is not self priming. And because of the way this machine moves all over the place, sometimes you get air bubbles and it could, you know, cut the flow. So I need to be self priming. And it's uh, working range is between three and 12 volts. And I think right now I'm running at a maybe six, maybe seven volts. It's plenty sufficient. It keeps the electronics cool most of the time. Sometimes I can even take it up, switch it off and you know, I'm still fine. I just need to watch the temperature every once in a while to make sure I'm good. The plan in the future is to have a, an external channel, a fifth channel, basically, to have the pump to be uh, from an auxiliary, auxiliary dial so I can adjust it on the fly to have, you know, more power, less power. Sometimes in colder climates, you don't need to, to run quite as quickly. and warmer climates, you need it to spin faster to have more effective cooling. So the goal is to have a, a secondary ESC to control just that one pump. And that's going to take power from the BEC. So like battery, BEC, ESC, more kind of complicated, but you know, it's a little fancy to say you have two speed controllers in your machine, one just to keep the other one cool. <laughs> Anyways. So that was my electronic setup for that machine. I know it's way overkill and most people don't need anything close to this but you do not want to go full throttle because it, it you, well first of all you can't really do it because it's going to overrun the motor but you don't have to because it flips over all the time if you don't like just going half throttle it's going to flip over so it's just freaking insane and there's no point in having that kind of power in a machine of that size i mean one horsepower per pound it's pretty insane so three things i need to talk about more um, one of them is the drivetrain. How can I cope with that amount of power? 10 horsepower is a lot. So uh, drivetrain, how did I deal with that? The track, how can I make a track that doesn't explode? Because yes, it has happened. And then the water cooling bits, how did it all goes together? And finally, the rest of the durability, like uh, carbon fiber reinforcement, um, aluminum mortar mount, and all of that kind of fancy stuff. So um, I'm gonna try to make all that in one video so I can have more of these video content out so you can see what 
it does in the snow, like how it drives, because I know you want to see it. I really want to show you how it does because it's insane what it can do. And on that note, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in a week for part three. You know, you witnessed history when the only thing left of your track is either sitting on a table or inside a transmitter box because it exploded. That's what makes for a great history. Curious to see what the data log says what RPM it went to before it exploded. This is insane. It took every single tooth out of this because some part of the track was still jammed in when it was spinning. And this is what I saw when I pulled it off. So it, it didn't break at one place, it broke multiple places throughout the track. So we might have more than one challenge to fix.